So thanks so much for joining us today uh, for our third presentation in the Employment Law and Financial Services series. Um, as always, these are bite-sized introductions to employment law considerations specific to regulated financial services businesses throughout the life cycle of an employee. So today we're going to focus on employee misconduct and disciplinary actions um, and misconduct both from pure employment context and more specific examples from the regulated sphere, including examples of both financial and non-financial misconduct. So in case you don't know me, uh, my name is Lauren Stephen. I'm an associate in the financial services regulatory team here at Fergus Paul, and I'm joined today by Laura Fitzpatrick, an associate in our employment team. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the swing of things, um, please keep your cameras off and microphones off during the presentation. We might not have time for questions, but our contact details are on the final slide, so please do get in touch if there's anything you would like to discuss with us. And we will be recording today's session and it will be distributed following the presentation. So what are we going to cover today? In today's session, we'll look at handling disciplinary procedures and things businesses need to consider when carrying these out. We'll cover the ACAS code and related guidance. Then we'll turn to think about disciplinary processes in the financial services sector in particular, before going, to look, going on to look at what we mean by financial and non-financial misconduct. So with that in mind, I'll hand you over to Laura to discuss disciplinary procedures. Thanks, Lorna. Um... So I'm sure some of you on the call will be very familiar with how to handle disciplinary procedures, but just to set the scene here, we thought we'd start by outlining some of the basics involved. So generally speaking, there are three stages in a disciplinary process, and ideally a different person should be responsible for each stage and with increasing seniority as you go along the process. The first stage is the investigation, this is a crucial stage, even in cases of apparently obvious guilt and potentially even where the employee admits culpability. However, on a practical level, the amount of investigation will vary quite significantly depending on the individual circumstances of the case. So an employer must carry out investigation as is reasonable in all the circumstances. Generally speaking, that means investigating sufficiently in order that the allegations can be put to the employee in sufficient detail to enable a meaningful response. The investigation should be even-handed, looking for evidence to prove the allegations as well as evidence to disprove. Investigators should be open-minded in all respects. It's important to remember that an investigation meeting is not a disciplinary hearing. And the role of the investigator is quite distinct from the person hearing the disciplinary. The investigator should not make findings about guilt or innocence. Instead, they should seek to establish the facts insofar as they can by reference to the available evidence, in addition to also identify, identifying what cannot be established. It will often, although not always, be helpful for the investigator to prepare a report summarising the steps taken in the investigation, the allegations and also the evidence available in respect of each of the allegations. This basically helps with the conduct of any disciplinary hearing. It's really crucial to the fairness um, of a disciplinary process in its entirety that the allegations are framed sufficiently clearly and precisely so that the employee can fully understand the case against them. The second stage in the process is the disciplinary hearing itself and also the subsequent outcome. Once the investigation is complete, if the employer decides that formal disciplinary action is needed and there is a case to answer, it should write to the employee to confirm the outcome of the investigation and invite them to a disciplinary hearing. At the disciplinary hearing, the employee should be given a reasonable opportunity with the help of their companion to present their version of events and produce any evidence in support of their position. It is key that the employee is able to respond to the allegations against them and any evidence that's being relied upon by the employer. The employer will then usually adjourn to consider whether to uphold the allegations and if so, what disciplinary sanction to apply in the circumstances. 
as you'll know, disciplinary sanctions will vary from first warnings to dismissal without notice. All of this depends on various factors, such as the seriousness of the allegations and the employee's previous disciplinary record. It's also important that the employer takes into account any mitigating circumstances that are put forward by the employee. The third and usually final stage is the appeal process. If an employee appeals the decision, they should be asked to set out the grounds of appeal in writing and the appeal chair should then consider those grounds. There is always or nearly always an appeal hearing um, and the main thing for the appeal chair to consider is whether the disciplinary process as a whole was fair. The decision of the appeal chair is usually final with no further steps in the procedure. Although it is worth noting that some employers do have a second layer of appeal. So moving on to um, the ACAS code and guidance, as well as being familiar with your own internal disciplinary procedure, you should be aware of the ACAS code of practice on disciplinary and grievances. Essentially, this sets out certain minimum requirements. And if employers don't comply with this, then compensation in certain employment tribunal claims can be increased by up to 25%. Employers' own disciplinary procedures should, as a minimum, be ACAS code compliance. The key principles of fairness, which are outlined in the ACAS code, include employers and employees should raise and deal with issues promptly and without unreasonable delay. Employers and employees should act consistently. Employers should carry out necessary investigations to establish the facts of a case. Employers should then inform employees of the basis of the problem and give them an opportunity to put forward their case in response before any decisions are made about their ongoing employment. Employers should also allow employees to be accompanied at formal meetings. An employer should also afford an employee the opportunity to appeal against any formal decision that is made. The ACAS code is supplemented by non-statutory ACAS guidance. This guidance does not need to be taken into account by tribunals and parties cannot be penalised for a failure to follow it. However, on a practical level, it does provide some useful guidance on the handling of disciplinary matters based on good industrial relations practice and several decades of unfair dismissal law. So it's definitely worth a read if you're involved in disciplinary proceedings, whether as HR or the manager chairing a particular stage of the process. So moving on now to disciplinary processes in the financial services sector. Of course, there is an additional layer to all of this when you're handling disciplinary procedures in a regulated sector, such as financial services. Take, for example, allegations of bullying in the workplace. In most cases, this would be viewed as an HR matter, requiring coaching or performance improvement, or perhaps disciplinary proceedings, depending on the severity of the problem. However, if that bullying behaviour has been carried out by a senior manager over a lengthy period and has created a culture in which challenge has been inhibited with potentially dam damaging implications for speak up channels, then it may be a regulatory matter. Misconduct cases, whether financial or non-financial, can be complex, involving balancing obligations to complainants, and the accused against the backdrop of the regulatory regime. It should also be made clear to employees what the employer considers to be misconduct, particularly gross misconduct. And so a good disciplinary procedure will set out a list, albeit usually a non-exhaustive list, of gross misconduct examples. In this sector, you'll want to think about specific examples that you may not have in other sectors. So for example, you'll always have theft and violence and that sort of thing as an example of gross misconduct. But in this sector, we'd encourage you to think about what else you might want to include. 
for example, breaches of the senior manager conduct rules and the individual conduct rules. And we often typically advise um, that certain of these are included in employment contracts or services agreements, such as in a termination without notice type of clause for senior managers. Crucially, in this sector, employers should be mindful that the potential consequences for the individual accused of misconduct are significant and potentially career-ending. In those sorts of scenarios, the employment tribunal will typically hold the employer to a higher standard and will expect a reasonable employer to have done more than they might otherwise have. For example, more might be expected in the investigation stage, or, for example, you might be expected to have had a non-standard companion, such as a lawyer, with the individual concerned in the disciplinary meeting in a way that you just wouldn't usually when handling a disciplinary process. Moreover, there is a requirement to identify, record and notify the regulators where disciplinary action has been taken against a person relating to a conduct rule breach. And disciplinary action for these purposes includes the issuing of a formal written warning, suspension or dismissal, or the reduction or recovery of remuneration. In terms of suspension, it's interesting to note that temporary suspensions pending investigation of whether or not there has been a conduct rule breach would not need to be notified. However, if a firm finds that an individual has breached a conduct rule, and suspends them while they decide what further action to take, they would need to notify the regulator. In that sense, it's really important to understand the regulatory definition of disciplinary action. I'll now hand over to Lorna to discuss financial and non-financial misconduct in a bit more detail. Thanks very much for that, Laura. That's really interesting. Um, so just moving on to financial misconduct, so under Section 1H of the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, which we lovingly refer to as FIDMA, um, financial crime is defined, and I've got it on the slide there, as fraud or dishonesty, misconduct in or misuse of information relating to a financial market, handling the proceeds of crime, and the, fin the financing of terrorism. So whilst this de definition isn't specifically one of financial misconduct, it's likely that the FCA would consider anything which is analogous to these points, but which possibly doesn't amount to a crime per se, um, as being sufficiently harmful to fall under misconduct. The definition is not exhaustive, um, so it can be interpreted widely and could include breach of financial sanctions or, for example, the Bribery Act 2010. And you'll notice um, if you've joined in some of our previous sessions, that there is some overlap between these heads of what could be financial misconduct and the FCA's considerations of honesty and integrity under the fitness and propriety test, um, which is set out in the, the fitness and propriety test part of the FCA handbook. The FCA has a statutory objective to protect and enhance the integrity of the UK financial services system which includes it's not being used for a purpose connected with financial crime. The fraud also potentially impacts on the FCA's objective to secure appropriate protection for consumers within financial markets. So the FCA has the power to bring enforcement proceedings um, against anyone for the criminal and civil offences of insider dealing and market manipulation. It can prosecute authorised firms and their officers uh, for breaches of money laundering regulations and fraud. So alongside these preventative measures, the FCA recognises the need for a strong enforcement response to maximise the deterrent impact of its fraud work. They've taken robust action with firms and individuals who dishonestly abuse their regulated status. Um, and at the same time, the FCA has invested more in its capacity to deal with the harm caused by those who operate outside the regulatory perimeter. And since April 2023, the FCA has charged 15 individuals with fraud offences, with more to be charged imminently. 
Um, last month, the FCA charged three individuals with fraud for their alleged involvement in a high-risk trading scheme, which targeted people's pension savings. The three individuals were charged with multiple offences, including fraud by false representation and fraudulent dealing, after they targeted victims by persuading them to invest in contracts for difference. The individuals were due to appear in court on the 7th of June, um, though no further details have been published at this point in time. So that's a, a very brief bit about financial misconduct. Um, and whilst it's certainly not an exhaustive list, um, financial, conduct, financial misconduct is usually a bit easier to identify. What is interesting at the moment is the regulator's stance on non-financial misconduct. Previously, it was thought that only misconduct relating to financial crime or other financial matters, like the ones we've discussed, already would be considered relevant by the regulators, given that they regulate the UK financial services sector. However, the regulators have made it very clear that they see non-financial misconduct by individuals within the financial sector as part of their remit. And any non-financial misconduct could have a significant impact on an individual's fit and proper status for the purposes of the overall SNCR regime. So back in December 2018, the FCA's Christopher Roulard very clearly stated that our message to firms is clear. Non-financial misconduct is misconduct, plain and simple. It's a very strong statement and very clearly bringing that within um, the perimeter of what the SCA will look at. Unfortunately, non-financial misconduct isn't a particularly clear area um, from like having set out FCA rules on, on the matter and whether and in what circumstances any non-financial misconduct could amount to a breach of say the conduct rules, in particular, the duty to act with integrity. So do we have any definition of non-financial misconduct? So the FCA has given examples um, of what it could include and be generally involve things like sexual harassment and misconduct, uh, racism, bullying, homophobia, and, and other forms of discrimination. So in February this year, as, as part of a wider initiative, the FCA sent a notice to provide information letter to insurance intermediaries on non-financial misconduct. And it actually set out quite a helpful definition in that. It said that non-financial misconduct includes, so unfortunately not an exhaustive list again, but it includes individual's conduct for issues such as, but not limited to, bullying, sexual harassment, and discrimination, whether in or outside the workplace. So the key points to draw out from this are that the conduct doesn't have to relate to the individual's job in the financial services sector. It could have completely, absolutely nothing to do with that. And it doesn't matter whether that conduct occurred in the office. It could be completely outside. The FCA is taking a strong stance on non-financial misconduct. And there are certainly people who feel like it is extending its remit. Uh, to consider not only financial misconduct uh, within the context of an individual's regulated role, which traditionally would have been quite well accepted that that would be within the FCA's remit, but also considering actions that might have occurred in a person's personal life. Um, it's also important to note um, from that notice to provide information, it also sought information relating to um, the number of non-financial incidents recorded, the method of detection, the outcomes and any further outcomes recorded, such as NDAs and employment tribunals for incidents that took place at the office, working from home, working off-site and social situations related to work. So it's clear that the SCA is actively monitoring this issue and looking for firms to provide details of any non-financial misconduct within their organisation. So just briefly looking ahead, um, the SCA and the PRA have been consulting on new rules around diversity and inclusion in the financial sector. And you'll see I've, I've listed the consultation paper there on the slide. And this includes proposals in relation to non-financial misconduct. So hopefully this will give us a little bit more clarity on the point. Um, the proposal is currently to include a new rule within COCON, which sets out how it applies to non-financial misconduct. Um, 
that consultation paper closed at the end of last year um, and the regulators are expected to publish a related policy statement at some point in 2024. So turning now to a specific case of non-financial misconduct um, and how that may impact individuals' fit and proper status, we'll take a look at the case of Brencham. So in 2021, the FCA had proposed a ban of Mr. Frensham, who was a financial advisor, on the basis that he was no longer fit and proper. This was on account of him being convicted of attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming. Whilst this conduct did not happen at or, or through his work and, and didn't involve dishonesty in the financial misconduct sense, the FCA sought to prohibit him from acting in a regulated capacity on the basis that he was no longer fit and proper and that he lacked integrity. So following the FCA's proposal to ban Mr. Frencham from acting in a regulated role, Mr. Frencham attempted to challenge them. He made the argument that the FCA had incorrectly applied its fitness and propriety test and that the FCA had allowed irrelevant considerations uh, to influence its judgment. However, the upper tribunal upheld the FCA's decision to propose the ban. The tribunal agreed Mr. Frensham was not fit and proper. However, it wasn't on the basis that the FCA had proposed the ban. The tribunal found that although serious, a criminal conviction alone would not have been sufficient to show that Mr. Frensham was no longer fit and proper. But the tribunal did decide that he should be banned, um, and this was due to um, a number of factors, including his failure to notify the FCA that he had been arrested and remanded in custody, his failure to notify the FCA that a professional body had declined to renew his statement of professional standing, and his lack of remorse. Um, the court did say that they expected um, there to be presented a more independent analytical justification of the link between Mr. Frensham's non-financial misconduct and the impact that it had on his role in a regulated business beyond the argument that his conduct could have negative impacts on the public's perception of the financial services industry. So firms considering whether non-financial misconduct impacts on an individual's fitness and propriety must remember that the applicable test is not, say, a moral judgment about an individual's conduct. Instead, firms must focus on whether they can establish a necessary link between the individual's non-financial misconduct and their fitness and propriety to perform the role. In Frenchum, this arose due to the individual failing to notify the FCA and his lack of remorse, which both called into called his ability to carry out his regulated role into question. And with that, I'll hand you back to Laura for some final thoughts on the overlap between employment, law, and the financial services sector. Thanks, Lorna. It's really interesting, particularly as matters like discrimination, bullying, and harassment in the workplace are you know, issues that employment lawyers advise on regularly. From an employment law perspective, having a good workplace culture and being proactive in preventing discrimination, bullying and harassment, and also taking effective steps when it does happen, has a multitude of benefits such as improved performance and morale, recruitment and retention, and of course, a reduced risk of employment complaints and litigation. As Lauren has touched on, it's not always clear though, whether something in this sphere is a breach of the conduct rules or makes an individual no longer fit and proper. The enforcement cases do tend to cover more serious examples such as sexual harassment and the possession of indecent images. There are and will be some areas where it is less clear, particularly in the absence of, of specific guidance, such as failing to make reasonable adjustments, indirect discrimination and examples of less serious bullying um, or less what is perceived as being less serious harassment at work. With that in mind, it's quite difficult for employers and us as advisors to know where to draw the line in determining 
whether it could or should be considered as non-financial misconduct for regulatory purposes. So with that in mind, please do just get in touch with us if we can help you navigate through any tricky disciplinary issues or procedures that you might be facing. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, so that was an overview um, of handling disciplinary procedures, the ACAS coding guidance more generally, as well as looking specifically at disciplinary processes and misconduct and financial misconduct um, within the, the financial services sector. And as Laura says, please do get in touch with us directly if you'd like to know more about anything we've discussed today or if we can help you with anything. So that's all that we are going to cover for today. Um, be great if you could join us next week for the final session in this series where we will be looking at termination of employment. Um, and if you're if you can't wait until next week's final presentation for some more FS Reg chat, uh, we're also running a consumer duty in the life and pension sector webinar at 9.30 on Thursday. We'll include the sign up link in our email sharing recording of this presentation. So thanks very much, everyone, for joining, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thank you.